I want to start with a, just a, a, a reflection on an event that we had um, this past Monday. Um, we're in the, the second of three parts um, leading up towards uh, a land acknowledgement with our tribal partners of the Salish Nations um, here in the Northwest. So we've been hosting events or we've hosted two events now. We had a blessing um, when we were in a virtual world and now we're going on site um, to acknowledge that the lands that we are on are, are traditional tribal lands. Um, and while we acknowledge the injustices that were done in the past, we can look forward to the future and, and, and how we, how we um, collaborate and acknowledge um, with our tribal partners um, their, their, their role within, within our communities. And it was a really, um, I mean, the words I've been using are impactful and moving um, ceremony. And I think we also had a very much of an impact on our tribal partners. Um, other land acknowledgements have been done. And what I heard from our partners on Monday was, you know, it's kind of a piece of paper just to say you did it and then you can kind of, you know, check that box off. And they have really appreciated the process by which we have gone through. And, and some of the important factors, you know, with tribal partners are, you know, the land is, is critical. Um, the waters are critical. And it, it's not, this is a part of who they are and, and what they believe. And, and, and this becomes a real critical factor. One of the interesting things that we also learn from them is, and as we move forward, is that they never want to leave anyone behind. So if if we have a patient in the hospital, expect expect many many of um, of our Native Americans to come with them to be present to support them to to be with them, and I think that's an an idea that we need to kind of think about in how we would support um, some of our tribal Native American friends being here um, in the hospital and how we would give them that space. So I'm going to offer up this uh, Native American prayer for peace this morning. O oh, great spirit of our ancestors, I raise my pipe to you. To, you, to your messengers, the four winds, and to the mother earth who provides for your children. Give us the wisdom to teach our children to love, to respect, and to be kind to each other so that they may grow with peace in mind. Let us learn to share all the good things you provide for us on this earth. So, a Native American prayer for peace. All right, so let's kind of get into some of the meat of the, the topics that we have today. Um, we got a couple, we, we, got, we really have this intended um, for two things. One, um, we want to really have a dialogue. So at any point, something comes up, raise your hand, put a comment in chat. Um, I'll kind of watch that as we're going along and then hopefully we can answer those in real time. Um, but if you have a question just in general. I think Deanna has put in, um, put some uh, uh, items there in the uh, in the chat so that you can go ahead and, and just toss those questions in there or utilize that form. I think that will, that will work out, but we'll try and answer those questions. What's top of mind for us here in our United community um, and, and what's most important. Now we've finished the uh, caregiver um, you know, survey a while ago. We had some uh, caregiver engagement interviews, and then we had uh, some town halls that, that we had with, with our caregivers to kind of see what was most important. One of the things that has resoundingly come up over and over again is about security. So uh, we asked today that uh, Brian McGlory, um, our security manager for the Northwest, would kind of give us an update of where we're at on some of the hot topics that, that are moving forward. And then, of course, as I said, if there's any questions, um, feel free to go ahead and ask those. So, Brian, I'm going to turn this over to you right now. Thank you very much, Chris. I really appreciate the invitation to join you all today. Um, I, I have a great love for our, the United General community and I, I want to support you as much as I can. So talking about security, the, there are a couple of really big issues going on in the Sage Woolley community and in the whole Skagit Valley 
community. And a lot of it is a, a difficult thing to ch to address, but something that we're committed to address, and that's the mental health population growth. Uh, I know that in the emergency department, we're just seeing consistent numbers of people coming in that are just having that difficulty or in a mental health crisis. And so some of the things that we are doing to address this is first and foremost, we're working to coordinate with Central Woolley Police Department. And actually next Tuesday, we're gonna be meeting with Chief Tucker and talking about some of the coming legislation and some of the legislation that was just signed by the governor and how it impacts the ability of Central Woolley Police Department, of Skagit County Sheriff's Department, and of the other communities to interact with those behavioral health populations and how we as the community hospital provide a way for them to safely transition those patients for us and for us to safely care for those patients. Uh, and that's that's a huge area of concern, both in United General and in all of the Washington-based hospitals because there are a lot of changes occurring. Some of the other things that we're working on, and I, I'm sure everyone has already seen the cameras that have gone up, and that project is getting near to completion. Some of the roadblocks we had with data storage are being resolved actually as I speak. In fact, I'm supposed to have a meeting later today with our TSP team talking about when we can go live with everything we have in place. So we're, we're working on getting that in place. We're also looking at some modifications, additions to our access control. One of the things I've heard over just resounding from our caregivers is that they want to be able to feel safe within their environment. And part of that is making sure that the right doors are locked and that they can be locked immediately if there is a concern. So if we have someone out in the parking lot that that is acting erratically, we can actually lock the doors quickly and get our caregivers safe while we're waiting for maybe law enforcement to respond or waiting for the person to leave. And so really, if I were to look at the priorities overall for security, number one is coordination with our community for the behavioral health population. Number two is getting our video surveillance system up and active and really up to the level that it needs to be at. And the third is getting that access control in place so that we can keep caregivers within the building safe. And the fourth area that I'm coordinating with our emergency management team on is ensuring that our Everbridge system and our mass notification systems enable us to reach caregivers who are not at work. The difficulty that, you know, having an issue at the hospital places upon our caregivers is when they're arriving to work, they don't know that it's not a safe environment. So working on getting the mass notifications systems in place so that you know before you ever arrive to work, oh, I should delay coming to work because there's something going on. There's a person in the ED parking lot. I don't you know, want to arrive in the middle of it, as has unfortunately happened. So I'm working with the uh, emergency management team so we can get those into place. So that's kind of the update of where we're at. Are there any questions? So Brian, this is Sharon and just one additional piece I think that we can um, share is that we are working together with the house supervisors to create scripting for what is my role in the event that we do have a lockdown so that all caregivers know what their role would be in that and that they would all feel comfortable and then we can start doing some drills. Um, because we know that practice makes perfect. So um, I'm very appreciative that you're partnering with us on that as well. Definitely, thank you. And Brian, I should also add there, um, there's a, some, some 
uh, lower level items that are also being uh, worked on at the facilities level. Um, you know, with some of the, the structural and design of some of the areas and barriers that we're looking at, some visibility shielding. Um, and one of the things I just want to mention is called one of our caregivers in our caregiver experience workshop um, had a really great idea. So that when we when we go on lockdown, we uh, we send out our Everbridge. Um, you know, sometimes that's a little bit hit and miss of whether the individual is able to read it or not. Um, but we had an experience with one of our caregiver, caregivers came onto campus during a lockdown, did not did not have that notification, um, and then tried to enter the building. And that was very concerning, very concerning to us from an administrative standpoint that they're they're trying to enter the hospital during a period where we're having a situation. Um, and they came up with what I think is a very simple um, idea that is utilized in other areas. Um, and we're, we're working towards that goal of putting up a red light, green light um, on the building so that there's a visibility um, indicator to our caregivers, whether you've gotten the message or not when you come on campus. And the other thing, and we've been working with this as well, is with our partners, on the campus here who are not necessarily part of our system. It also will be a visibility to them to understand that there's an incident going on at the hospital. So that, that security factor is gonna be really important. And I should also mention the point with our partners, the dentist office, Country Meadows, um, we went and reached out to all of them and said, do you wanna be part of our Everbridge system? So if, if we're having an event on campus, you know, the police have cordoned off, you know, hospital drive or some of the other areas um, that they can have awareness to understand that there's an incident happening because we want to take care of, you know, our folks over at the medical group and the district and the uh, country medals, everyone on the campus to give them that information as soon as possible. All right, any, any other questions around security? Feel free to just open up your mic and ask that question or type it into the chat. All right, Brian, I, I'm sure you'll you'll stick around for a little bit and thank you for that information Definitely. this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. I I want to shift a little bit away from security and talk a little bit about some of the projects that we're working on. They have a, a really big impact on, um, on how we move forward um, as an organization. And I think as you can kind of see the, um, I'm gonna ask Rod to kind of jump in here. And the projects that we're working on are really setting United up for future success um, and how we bring more services to our community and keep expanding the ones we have. So. Ron, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, all right, so we're going to go over four or five projects today. Um, can everybody see my screen? We can. Thank you, Ron. We can. We can. Perfect. Thank you. So the first one we're going to go over is a project that's currently underway, and that's our new CT and Nuke Med project. So far, we've completed the nuclear medicine portion of this um, project, which is this square here. And uh, our new equipment's installed, and everything is running wonderful. The new space is beautiful and very functional, and the staff that are working in there are extremely happy. We're currently- Rod, Rod, Rod can I interrupt you for just one minute? Yeah. Just so we're, um, I started sharing and I think you started sharing. So I'm going to stop just to make sure everybody can still see. Okay. Because you said you pointed out something and I didn't. Ah, it, so. okay. So let me try, try that see. again. All right. Let's try that again. You're, you're live now. You're good. All right. Perfect. So. This square here is the nuclear medicine department, which we've have completed. We are currently working on this CT department. Um, and uh, they're putting sheetrock up today and we start painting next week. Our new CT scanner gets here on July the 10th. And then we'll start seeing patients on that the, the probably around the 
he's 12th, 13th maybe. Um, so great time um, and um, we're very excited. Then the following uh, phase of that project is where our current CT scanner sits is going to be a new NukeMed and tread, I mean a new uh, treadmill and echo room that um, they'll be moving into. So the whole project should be completed somewhere in mid-August, um, maybe early September. And um, we're very excited to have that done. Our next project is one that's been in the process for it seems like forever, and that's our new sterile processing department. Um, what started out as a kind of a small remodel has turned into a redo of the entire department. This is an exceptionally exciting little um, project and will really um, allow us to move forward in our surgical services department. This um, project includes a, a cart washer, which we do not have today, two full instrument washers that are pass-throughs, a whole remodeled of our decontamination space, and then three brand new sterilizers, one of them being a big sterilizer. So the advantage here is we now have this giant room. We have right now the dishwashers we have are about the size, I mean the uh, instrument washers we have are about the size of a dishwasher. These are full pass-through instrument washers and a full pass-through cart washer. Today we have to take things out of the hall and bring them out into this public corridor and then out and back in again. This will allow us to keep everything within the department. So from an infection prevention standpoint, from a workflow standpoint, um, and from an ability to do larger and more complicated cases, this project gets us set up to do that. We expect this project to start sometime probably in late August, early September, and we'll go throughout and uh, the rest of the year and be completed sometime towards the end of January. The third project I wanna go over is we will be replacing our, our current CT simulator that's in the um, oncology department with a brand new system. Um, this will include updating of this current area, new cabinets, new flooring paint, um, and a um, brand new um, state-of-the-art um, CT sim. So. This is an, another exciting project that will be happening, and this one is slated. We'll tear out the old um, CT probably around the uh, August or September-ish, and then um, it'll, 30 days later, we'll put the new one in. So this will be an exciting new project, and they, they've had this scanner for a long time. So this is gonna be a great um, upgrade for them. The other thing that's happening in oncology is we are looking at putting in a new linear accelerator. The new linear accelerator is um, is actually on the outside of the building. So right here is our current um, outside of the building. The little drive through in front of oncology is right here. And you can see by this blue wall how thick these walls, these new concrete walls are going to be. Um, the system will be kind of facing this direction. That helps us take advantage of some of the um, concrete that's currently in our linear accelerator, which sits right here. So this is a, obviously a large project that includes expanding the envelope of the building, um, a lot of civil work that happens out here, making sure that whatever we put um, in the ground can hold the weight of these giant concrete um, walls and adding new spaces inside the building for offices and stuff that are displaced due to this new vault coming in. So um, this has been submitted for um, capital and will hopefully go to the system capital in July. Um, and we are, we've done um, RFPs for architects and they've mm -hmm. all been on campus to look at the um, system and, um, and, and kind of what our plans are and they are um, giving us their proposals um, as we speak. So um, tomorrow we'll give we'll answer any questions they have for their proposals, and I think their proposals will be due in about a week and a half. So exciting project, big, big project you'll see going on in the campus. Um, I don't have a timeline for this yet, but you know our goal is to get this um, started um, definitely this year. And the final project I want to go over is we will be getting a new um, MRI from um, Alliance Imaging. This is a brand new um, Siemens Era, which is a large bore um, MRI. 
Um, this um, MRI will have cardiac capabilities. But the other exciting thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking the trailer and wrapping it in um, a Peace Health um, uh, design. And as you can see here, this is, you know, um, a picture of our local area. You have the diagnostic imaging, you have MRI, Peace Health, and it's wrapped all the way around. So when people come into the campus and see the trailer sitting there, this is kind of the picture they're going to see um, when they drive in. So once again, another exciting thing happening in imaging and it expands our ability to do cardiac and other, um, other things. So any questions about projects? Right, I got a, a couple of comments and questions uh, okay. that come to mind. One is, um, Deanna, the, the, the wrap for the diagnostic imaging, when do we anticipate that being visible? So that is actually scheduled to go into production when we get our credit application um, and all of that stuff tied up, hopefully by the end of this week. And I believe production is about a three week cycle. So we're looking at around early, mid early July for that being finished um, and then delivered, I assume shortly after that. I know there's a setup period that Rod is probably more familiar with, but this will be coming to us in July. That's what we expect. Great. So pretty pretty soon, actually, then. So I'll, that'll be neat. And that'll be what people see as they enter the campus um, off of Highway 20, because that's where that trailer sits. So that's going to be really cool. Rod right on the right on the LINAC, Curiosity, what are we doing with the old one? The old one will stay in place and we'll use it um, as a backup if we need to. Um, the, the goal would be that, you know, we would use a true beam then if our volumes continue to grow, we could remove this LINAC and put in, you know, another device that kind of is a transition between the larger LINAC and um, it looks kind of more like a CT, but it allows us to um, do treatments um, that don't require, you know, the true beam to do. So that would require a way for us to do two different types of treatments here at the campus. Great. And and lastly, I just want to comment back to the um, CT Nuke uh, Nuke Med project and and everything that's going on there. We have the new Nuke Med cameras in place. I think you mentioned that, and I see we got some of our friends in from the medical group um, here. What's the impact of that going to be for um, cardiology and and some of our folks in the community? The, well, for cardiology, um, one of the big changes that we made is now. Um, uh, Peace Health Medical Group Cardiology is reading all of our cardiac nuke studies. So um, that brings that other level of expertise to our cardiac nuke studies. We also have the um, an increase in resolution that we didn't have before and an increase in how we process the cardiac images. So a combination of those three things um, should really uh, um, allow us to take that program to a new level. And what will that mean from a volume standpoint? We're hoping, I mean, right now we do about, you know, five to six cardiacs a, a week. We did prior to the new camera. Right now we're doing about two a day um, right now. Um, and our goal is to get up to do five a day. Great, thank you. Any other, any other questions or thoughts for Rod about work going on campus? Again, like security, we've got a number of other smaller projects going on um, that are they're happening all over the campus. We've got a lot of concrete work going on right now because um, we kind of got some good weather and it's summertime, so you're going to be seeing some um, different walkways and things being upgraded. So um, that that'll be more visible as some of these bigger projects as um, begin to 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 start up. So. All right, I'm going to pause for for a moment. Anything that uh, questions that folks have, they want to just kind of open up their their mics and and throw out there. We've got a good we've got a good um, kitchen of experts on the line that I'm sure can answer just about anything. Or if you're more comfortable, feel free to go ahead and put that in chat.
I did get a couple of questions as you think about those um, that I did get uh, via email. So I'm going to ask Crystal. I believe Crystal's on the line right now, our infection prevention uh, expert, because we still have a couple of questions that are. <laughs> yes, you are, Crystal. You Good are morning. an expert. A <laughs> um, couple, a couple of COVID questions for you, um, and kind of the de-escalation, and maybe Saren, you can kind of help because I know you're working with the treatment team, and they're kind of guiding a lot of the de-escalation work. Um, first question, Crystal: Will caregivers who are fully vaccinated be able to stop wearing masks? If no, why not? That 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 is a good question. I. I wonder that myself. So it definitely is a partnership on the um, peace health level between the treatment team and infection prevention throughout the entire organization. But we really get our guidance from CDC as well as what state and federal legislature saying, um, more so state. So some of the new updates or guidelines that were updated in May um, really call out that this is not for healthcare type settings yet. And a lot of it is dependent on what the numbers are like within the community where the facility is. Um, Skagit County has dropped significantly over the last two weeks. And we're hoping that um, with that and with hopefully Governor Inslee lifting some restrictions or in at the end of June, that we'll be able to have more of a conversation about it. Um, I know that at the system level, they have been having conversations of how do we move to that next phase of no masking. Um, I can say that it would be difficult to differentiate, and I know that this is probably another question just because this has been asked of me before, um, who has been vaccinated and who hasn't. So I think that we really want to get to a place where, where we don't have to worry about calling out who's vaccinated and who isn't, because of course that is everyone's individual choice, and we just want to move to a place where we can safely all unmask. Um, as a, far as a timeline, it's it's really hard to say this this pandemic, I think, has taught us that we all have to, you know, uh, be ready at a moment's notice for any changes that come down the pike. Yeah, and I would just reinforce that. So, as Crystal stated, um, based on CDC recommendations, public transport, hospitals, um, there's still the mask requirement there, and those are exceptions that are called out in um, in any of the um, public forums, so the hospital and Peace Health is taking lead from that. Um, Offsite areas and other things, there is more talk about um, who can be masked and unmasked if it's not on the hospital grounds. Um, so there will be more clarification coming out soon. Great, thank you, Sharon. Um, Couple other questions related to masking and one about um, vaccines. I think there, I think you might have answered this, but since I'll, I'll ask it, these questions is directly. Will caregivers who haven't received the COVID vaccine need to continue to mask if vaccinated caregivers are allowed to remove their masks? Yeah, that's that's definitely a hard question because I know that the ultimate goal is to move forward and just having um, getting to a place where we can all be unmasked while we work. Um, now that COVID exists, I anticipate that anyone coming in with respiratory symptoms into the hospital, we will have to mask up to care for them. And that's not any different than any other trans transmission based precautions that we've used in the past with patients that are sick. Um, but we really don't want to point at the people that are vaccinated, those that aren't, because again, that's an individual based um, decision. And of course, we're hoping, although there isn't enough data yet, just because the vaccine was only offered uh, starting the beginning of this year, that we'll be able to prove that there is herd immunity so we can safely all unmask. Um, unfortunately, it's it's one of those things where we'll just have to wait and see con <laughs> continuously as this pandemic has shown us. Okay, and here's a softball for you, Crystal. Are new caregivers offered the COVID vaccine upon employment? Um, so I did reach out to Employee Health yesterday to ask them that, and um, they did send me a document over that uh, staff can make an appointment with Peace Health to get the vaccine, um, either upon hire or if they're uh, 
caregivers that have been with us for any amount of time can call and make an appointment with Peace Health. And this flyer, let me see if I can, um, I'll add it to the chat here in a bit, um, also leads to other places that are offering the vaccine as well. All employee health asks is that if you get it from a non-Peace Health facility that you send them record of vaccination. And once you have completed both doses, if it is both doses, unless it's a Johnson Johnson that you are able to send a copy of their card. Um, so it is offered, but it's offered on a, a uh, appointment made basis. Great, thank you. Great, great information. Thank you, sure. Crystal. And, and Sharon, maybe this last one is is more in, in your alley. Um, as your work with the de-escalation uh, with the treatment team. When will we open up the hospital cafeteria and gift shop to all visitors and, and who makes that decision? So that also is really going to be led with by um, the number of cases in our community. And so as we see a, a large drop off, our restrictions for visitors will continue to be lifted and changed. And one of the nice things that we're doing right now, I think, is sharing the changes a week in advance so that we can prepare for it. We can also send out the communications to our teams to minimize the um, confusion that can occur if we make a change and nobody has been advised of it. And then there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of questions that arise. So as we start lifting visitor restrictions, those will be a communicated a week in advance if we're going to do any changing or lifting of that. As it stands right now, we have not lifted that um, for some volunteers or for cafeteria access and other things. But I think as or if and when we see a significant drop in our community, those will be part of our de-escalation discussions. Thank you, Sharon. Appreciate that. Any other COVID related um, questions, thoughts? Chris, I think one additional thing that I just wanted to share is that um, we are still really looking to how we can vaccinate patients, inpatients and emergency department patients um, while they are in our care. As it stands right now, we know that you know there's 10, 10 or 11 or six um, doses per vial, so it would make it very difficult um, if we didn't have that many individuals wanting a vaccination. But I think nationwide, we're looking at how do we create um, either single dose vials or an opportunity to vaccinate patients who are in our care who want to be vaccinated and make that happen real time rather than advising them to go somewhere else once they're discharged. All right, thank you, Sharon. All right, um, got just a few more minutes. Um, I got just a couple more questions for you. Um, we'll kind of go through through these and that if you have any more, go ahead and throw them in the chat or feel free to just uh, jump out here. Um, how is UGMC doing financially post COVID? Um, uh, yeah, so how are we doing financially? So we continue to see incremental steady <laughs> growth and um, we've been seeing it across the board um, in all areas. A couple of numbers I can share with you um, in our, um, in our, uh, acute care census, we're seeing an increase in 15% um, from this year to, to last year. Um, now, understanding that last year was kind of in the middle of the COVID times. Um, so if you go back to a year before that, um, we're 12.5% above that. So we actually in May had our highest average daily census um, that we've ever had um, from an inpatient side. Um, our operating room, um, surgical services is seeing tremendous growth. Um, we've seen about a 50%, 52% uh, increase in surgical cases. 
Um, I think in March, April, we set um, all-time highs, at least in, since we've been with um, Peace Health. Um, so that is really super significant. Um, diagnostic imaging, I think it's a great uh, indicator of where we are within the community um, with all the outpatient work they've done. Uh, we've seen an increase of 12.7%. And then, um, and then finally, I would just mention the ED, which is probably took the biggest hit during COVID as far as uh, volume. Um, we have seen over the last um, four to five weeks that volume has, has slowly been creeping back, creeping back, creeping back. And we're now starting to see our pre-COVID volumes. We, we traditionally saw about 1,000 to 1,100 patients. Uh, per month in the ED, and we're still continuing to see that. I will put this caveat in there um, that we have also seen a higher acuity. That's um, one of the, the interesting things that we've observed over the last year is that we did, even though we we're seeing lower volumes, we were seeing higher acuity. We're still seeing the higher acuity, but now we're seeing more patients. Um, so that that team is really working. Um, if you go down there, you're going to find that they're they're busy um, a good portion of the day, and certainly in that those evening hours where it's always been it's, it's always been um, high volume. So, from a from a financial um, uh, aspect, uh, UGMC is very solid. Um, we're seeing we're seeing good work happening, and just want to just shout out to to all our teams because I've seen this in every area of the hospital. Um, just the the work that's being done, and I uh, and just acknowledging that this year has has really been challenging um, for for our folks as we deal with people being out for various reasons, you know, picking up the slack, um, and just really want to commend all the teams for their their efforts to continue to be here and and, and to make that happen and take care of our patients. Um, and lastly, I'm going to leave, leave you with this, uh, this question, unless there's anything else that I, that I hear. Are we having the annual caregiver picnic this year? And um, my answer to that is yes. One way or another, we are going to have a caregiver picnic. Um, depending on where we're at with um, restrictions and de-escalations, um, we will do that if possible in person, um, but if not, we will celebrate our caregivers with a picnic one way or another, and usually we have that in the, in the August timeframe. All right. I want to thank everybody for, uh, uh, for joining us today. Uh, just a reminder, if you go back into, to your teams and in your units, we have another uh, town hall this afternoon. Um, Probably be pretty much the same information, but you're welcome to join us a second time if you like. Um, other than that, I wish everybody a fantastic Thursday and hope you're all doing well. Thanks.